When we started Yobs, this is like two years before COVID. And everything we do is all about remote work and about like video-based software, helping companies hire better remotely, develop their talent remotely. But you know, back then, like the market for what we were doing was a lot smaller. Like we just had this hint that over like a 10 year period, and we were willing to be patient. We just knew that, okay, over like a decade, remote work is, is, is gonna keep growing and growing and growing. And you already had a couple of companies that were remote first, but we thought, look, like people are gonna keep hiring in other countries, et cetera. I mean, we had no idea that something like COVID was gonna happen. My name is Kevin David, and if you want real financial freedom for yourselves and for your loved ones today, then the time is now and I will be there to help you every step of the way. What is up guys and welcome back to another exciting episode of your favorite podcast or soon to be favorite podcast, The Kevin David Experience. Um, thanks to everybody who left us reviews on iTunes since our last episode. And a big thanks to everybody who shared the podcast with just one friend or family member or coworker. It helps us grow the podcast. So big shout out to you guys. So we have a very exciting guest joining us today, um, Rafael Danilo, who's going to be talking about you know artificial intelligence and funds and being an entrepreneur and a bunch of exciting things. And so Rafael, the first question that we ask everybody on the show is to try your best to summarize your journey as an entrepreneur all the way up until right now in 60 seconds or less. All right, let's do it. Um, so yeah, my name is Rafael. I'm from France originally. Um, I, I'm 23 years old and um, the entrepreneurial journey really started when I was 16. I went to Tanzania um, to be like an English school teacher. Um, and I, I basically like fell in love with the country, fell in love with like what what you know a lot of local people were doing there in terms of activism and and when i when i had to go back i was like you know uh, screw this like i want i want to keep helping like how can we do this and so I, I partnered up with like a local teacher and we started this nonprofit where we would fundraise in europe and the us and like send back gifts uh, send back like books for schooling do scholarships and all that stuff and that, that just like like just gave me enough of that uh of that heat to like just want to do this for for my whole life and so when I got to college, the first thing I did, like, you know, by my sophomore year was like start another company, which is not my current company. Um, and, and always about like looking at the problems around me and, and trying to solve them. And so like today we're, we're uh, working on this company called Yods, um, which is like remote talent development software powered by AI, as you mentioned. Right. Yeah. And that, it's super interesting because I mean, you know, one of the things and, you know, I, I read a lot about startups and Paul Graham and kind of like all the like popular, you know, thought leaders as, as far as that goes. And I talked to a bunch of, you know, real, super successful startup founders as well. And, and, you know, one of the recurring themes that I hear all the time is like, you know, and this is similar to like the Wayne Gretzky quote where it's like good hockey players are where the puck is and great hockey players are where the puck's going to be. Um, uh -huh. Like, what are your thoughts on like when you're when you're kind of deciding about what uh, industry to get into, whether or not you have those specific skills, um, you know, do you think that that's like critical or the most critical thing to like choose a, a business or a niche where the market is going to be in like two or three years? Or would you rather go to where the market is now? Yeah, man, that's such a good question. Um, well, I'm, I think about that a lot as a founder, obviously, because that's where like you, is the highest leverage exercise to be a founder, right? Because you're putting basically all your eggs in one basket and you're saying like, this is the thing I'm going to go after. And then as an investor, I'm able to diversify a little bit more and think about like, what are the different spaces I can I get back? Um, like generally speaking, you're right. It's it's a lot more lucrative um, and it, it's a much better long term bet to look at like where the market is going. Um, a good example of that is, so when we started Yobs, this is like two years before COVID and everything we do is all about remote work and about like video based software, helping companies hire better remotely, develop their talent remotely. But you know, back then, like the market for what we were doing was a lot smaller. Like we just had this hint that over like a 10 year period and we were willing to be patient. We just knew that, okay, over like a decade, remote work is, is, is going to keep growing and growing and growing. And you already had a couple of companies that were remote first, but we thought, look, like people are going to keep hiring in other countries, et cetera. I mean, we had no idea that something like COVID was going to happen. And then, and then it feels like when you, when you're backing the right trends, even if you're a little bit early, as long as you're patient enough and you hustle enough, eventually, like it, it it's almost like the market uh, fits around you and like the, the pace accelerates. And in our case, we got super, super lucky almost from the perspective of COVID hitting and remote work, like 10 xing in a matter of six months. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, 
if you have enough patience, long term it long term it works. There is such a thing as bad timing, though. I mean, you look at there's so many examples of companies that got in too early into a market, and then like lo and behold, like three years later, they're just not able to like get enough traction, get investors, you know, build the best product. And so they just end up dying before before there ever becomes like a real need for it, and and that many times like Jobs could have been that company. Uh, I guess to, we were just late enough or early enough that that the timing ended up working out. Yeah, for sure. And it's an interesting thing too, like with uh, Coinbase, like for example. Um, you know, Coinbase is a is I think a perfect example of this, where you know they kind of I think they started in 2012, right? So like or, or something near that. Um, where basically, uh, you know, now they're valued at like a hundred billion dollars because they got into the crypto market before it was like cool to be in the crypto market. So I guess, you know, the, the difficulty becomes, you know, how do you actually identify uh, a particular market that's going to be, you know, that's going to become what crypto is now to when Coinbase was founded. So like, you know, in the insight that you have, you know, running a, a multi-million dollar fund, um, being a startup founder yourself, where do you see, you know, the trends kind of going in 2021 forward? Like what's going to be the next crypto in your opinion, or where should people be focusing about building their companies or, or spending their time? Because, you know, something that I think is important for people to understand is like Elon Musk wasn't like a rocket expert when he started SpaceX, right? He just had like a technical insight and he acted on it. Um, and, you know, like Brian Armstrong wasn't, a, you know, necessarily like a crypto expert before it was even possible to become a crypto expert. So, I mean, people get good at what they do. And so just because, you know, you have these limiting beliefs saying, I'm not good at crypto, I'm not an expert at this or that, right? I think that that's a, a really bad excuse. Um, and I think people get good at whatever they spend their time doing. So what do you, do you agree with that statement? And then what do you think the next trends are that are coming about? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, what I like to do is I, I like to, you know, it's I like to invest in picks and shovels is like what I call it. And, and, and when I say invest, I also mean my own time, my own energy, right? So also like when I'm thinking about building my own business. So, so you know, Coinbase is a great example because Coinbase, like think of it in terms of like, it doesn't go up or down, up or down if the, if the price of like Bitcoin goes up or down, right? Uh, regardless of whether of what where the trading volume goes, it's just the more people trade Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, Coinbase goes up. Right. And what we're seeing is regardless of where you think Bitcoin is going to be at in one year, two years, three years, what is almost a certain statement is that more and more people are getting into Bitcoin because at first it was maybe some like, you know, super, super niche, like retail investors who were like the crypto punks. And then now it's like more all retail investors. Now we're seeing hedge funds, JP Morgan being ETF, building ETFs around it. So regardless of where you think the price is going to go, investing in the picks and shovels is really where it's at and it and it, but this has been true for hundreds of years like back in the the gold rush you know it's like people used to uh you know sell, like the people who made the most money weren't the ones hunting for the gold they were the ones like selling the actual picks and shovels to get the gold um so i think like when the areas that i'm excited about is think about like where the world is going over the next five to ten years and then like what are the best picks and shovels that you can build and so for example some things that are that are like almost certain Right, is that like machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence software in general are like quote unquote eating the world, right? It's, it's just becoming embedded everywhere. Um, same thing with like fintech. We're seeing fintech products starting to be embedded in every single aspect of our lives. Um, you know, where like at the point of sale, you have some like fintech thing like Klarna that allows you to, you know, buy now, you know, do, do later. All of your different accounts are now super easy to sort of connect. So those are some some of the things, you know, in consumer, there's also a lot of stuff like around video, around like social commerce, around building communities, communities is huge. So you have all these different themes and they all look like they're disconnected. But like as a thesis, what we do as a fund and also like when I'm thinking about my own company is like, what are the tools that all of those people are going to need to build the best businesses, right? Um, without putting all your eggs in one basket. So a great example would be like, a company like Plaid, which I think is like one of the most exciting fintech businesses out there, they were about to be acquired for four billion last year by Visa. That fell through, and now they just raised around at a fifteen billion dollar valuation. So good, good for them, almost that the acquisition didn't go through. Um, but what these guys do is they basically build this like infrastructure API that connects all the different fintech tools and and financial products that you use. So if you want to connect your Charles Schwab account to your like Robinhood account. 
and you do the you know little like login where it says like oh like login that's plaid you know and it's like you would never even know that they exist but it's going to be one of the biggest fucking companies on earth right um and like same thing with uh with video like i'm really excited about like video infrastructure software um company like hop in which lets you do like you know virtual events at scale and it's just like the same thing like infrastructure layer so think about like when you think about the next coinbases the next like you know the next zooms like i think about platforms i think about infrastructure layers and in terms of ai and machine learning which is the part i'm really excited about i i i really really like to look at dev tools and uh especially like data science tools so like tools for data scientists to do their job and that's a very very like underlooked underrated area because not many people understand or have built ai products so they don't know what the hell is like the problem and like what you know what problems these guys face when they're building when they're building these tools um and and that goes back to your point as well which is being early in these cases is also really critical like if you if you just join whatever trend is hot and shiny after everybody's already in the the delta for you like the the actual value that you can capture is really limited but there are There, there's huge value to be captured in being early and so in this case like for me data science tools dev tools is like one of those areas where i feel like i have a, a non fair advantage yeah yeah no i mean that's, that's actually all so incredibly true and i i agree with like literally 100% uh of what you said which is just an interesting point right because like like for me like artificial intelligence machine learning like these sound like like just buzzwords right but like nobody right. or most people don't actually know like what that means like to to a to somebody who may not be like an expert or deal with it day in and day out like what are some like examples or like metaphors or or an easy way to understand like what machine learning actually is and how it's going to be applicable to our lives and similarly our artificial intelligence yeah and you're and you're you yeah, also I love that you just separated the two right because like they are intertwined in the sense that like you know uh machine learning ai like those are concepts that are intertwined but the, but there there are fundamental so sort of like differences so ai is 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 basically a piece of software that replicates something that we thought required like human cognitive abilities so for example like uh, uh if you build a piece of software that's able to to do art that's able to paint or something like we used to think that that required like unique like human cognitive abilities and then now ai is able to do it Um machine learning is is typically a lot more sort of like about scaling a process that we've understood that we've broken down into rules and then now software is just able to like get better and better at doing it but you, you have to break it down into rules. The the easiest way to sort of make a bet on like where machine learning and AI are going to like you know actually make a difference and they're going to be applicable because they're not going to be applicable to everything. There are things that are going to take decades for AI and ML to like really you know make a make a big you know stride into is can you define this into rules if you can define any process into like rules that are like somewhat um sort of like repetitive and redundant and understandable then machine learning not even ai machine learning will do a terrific job yeah um and then ai is when you need to start getting into like more more sophisticated tasks and uh there there's what's called basically like unsupervised learning where the data scientist or the person the the person who's making the algorithm doesn't even fully understand how the algorithm is getting to its output how it's getting to its results right um but it but it's still it's still sort of getting there because it's giving it enough data of like here's the right answer here's the wrong answer and it does it like 5 million times so that it can eventually get there yeah. um but there's there's practical applications of ai and ml already sort of like everywhere in our lives um specifically in like the feeds that you guys interact with that we interact with every day on on youtube on on facebook uh on instagram Like there's a lot of machine learning and personalization there like same thing when you shop on Amazon and there's a tool like another product that's recommended to you same thing there right like there's there's machine learning there that's you know uh in the background Amazon is tagging like every single click that you have it's tagging oh like you're looking at fans right so like you know you must be interested in fans like you need a fan cuz it's too hot in Miami um and you know and then it's going to recommend you more fans right yeah and i love that and i i don't know how much you you followed it but um i'm like a big uh chess guy like i i enjoy chess um and there was a you know alpha 0 and and deep mind from google um which was yeah. really incredible where basically what happened was this computer this this artificial intelligence played itself millions of times and stopped fish which is kind of like the other most powerful engine um and then it was yeah. able to kind of defeat uh stockfish which was 
you know, otherwise basically undefeatable by humans at that point. Um, which was like incredibly in interesting and exciting to watch. And so, you know, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see, you know, Google's deep mind and their artificial intelligence kind of like go after like the next thing. Because uh, originally, I, I think it was Go like this, this, uh, this game in, uh, I believe, Asia. I don't know much about it, but it was like this very complicated game. And they played like the yeah. top person from Korea who's like undefeated by any human ever. And then it won. And then it kind of did Starcraft and then it did chess. Like where, where do you see uh, deep mind if you know about them? Um, where do you see them focusing on next? Yeah, I mean, I think like the, the, the thing with DeepMind, um, OpenAI to some extent, but I think OpenAI is, is already more, that's like uh, Elon Musk uh, and, and the former YC president's like AI, AI research lab, basically. The thing is with these research labs, they don't really have any pressure to build anything concrete that like physically helps like solve specific problems. What they're more focused on is like, pushing the cutting edge when it comes to like more fundamental AI and machine learning research, right? Which is cool, but it's basically like people are going to build on top of DeepMind and they're going to build on top of OpenAI. But like the, the real world use of like an AI that can be the best chess player in the world or go player in the world, like what value does that really bring? Like not, not you know, not, not much, right? Like, yeah. but if you could solve real problems around like you know, helping avoid, um, uh, you know, uh, car crashes, you know, by like providing some sort of analytics to cities or like, you know, changing, you know, providing analytics to cops or to paramedics so that they can intervene faster when there's a fire or when there's a terrorist, you know, who has a gun because you can recognize that there's a gun in his hands. Like th those are real practical applications that could actually have much, you know, um, much better sort of much better uses. And I think the the kind of, again, rule of thumb or the principle that I try to apply to these things, because like, I'm, I'm not inside of the deep mind or open AI lab, so I, I can't tell you like, oh, what I think they're going to focus on next. What I can tell you, though, is that it, the same principle that you can apply to crypto and blockchain, um, you can apply to AI and machine learning, and you can apply to a lot of these other spaces that are really hot. Um, it, those, there, it's not just hype. Like There is real breakthrough technology behind blockchain and behind crypto. There is some incredible stuff there. Same thing with AI and machine learning. I mean, we see it with our clients, like with, it's, it's incredible the type of result they get in terms of like being able to develop thousands of employees remotely where before they were only able to like have consultants work on like 50 or hundred people. Right. right? And then now you have thousands of people that are able to like tap into this like personal development uh, content, like via, via the type of work that we're doing. So there's really real world applications. What you have to be really mindful of when you're thinking of like, and I think blockchain, and, and I know very little about blockchain, but it's, it's just research it and try to discern what is real and what is practical. And typically what you read in the press, like what you're going to read in Forbes, Wired, et cetera, is going to be a lot of the hype. It's going to be whatever gets the most views. So just know that in this case, they make money by having people read the article. It's not a scientific paper. There's a reason why scientific papers are so boring and no one reads them. It's because there's just accurate like information in there, right? Yeah. If, ever, if if all the articles in Forbes or Wired were like only focused on being super objective or whatever, you know, it, like they wouldn't get as many viewers. So they're looking at like just bringing up what is the most, uh, uh, you know, crazy and like what will make people's eyes like, you know, blow up. And so when you read about AI or blockchain in like mainstream media, just know that it's fundamentally biased. Not be, I'm not saying that Wall Street Journal or Forbes is biased, it's just that the mm -hmm. information they present to you is a story, it's entertainment. Yeah. It's entertainment more than it's like actually informational. Um, and so I think as long as you keep that principle in mind, um, then there's there's some real opportunities within blockchain, within even you know NFTs, which is like blowing up right now. I haven't even started like fully reading up on it. I'm sure there are actual things there, but the only thing that you're gonna read about if you're just a lay person and you're just like thinking about it and reading Forbes like me right now about NFTs is oh something some you know piece of like digital thing sold for like 23 million dollars and like i'm going to be like that's ridiculous yeah and that's about as much as i'm going to know about it yeah and so like let's let's talk about yobs for for the last question or two i, I asked you so for for yobs right like it, first of all do you think it's important as a startup to be profitable kind of from the beginning or at all? Or, or do you focus more on growth? How do you think about that? And then the second question I'll ask you about Yobs is how do you guys like what's your primary source of new customers? How do you find them? Is it through paid media? Is it through referrals? Um, do you do cold outreach to specific businesses? How, how does that work? Yeah, both both good questions. Um, so 
I mean, I, I think as far as like being profitable versus focusing on growth, for me, there's just like two fundamentally different like types of businesses. Um, on, on the one hand, you have sort of like the, the venture backed businesses or, or sort of like tech companies like ours, where it's a very, very high margin business that like once you've built the tech, what's called the marginal cost, right? So like once I've built my product, the marginal cost is close to zero. Right. That, that's a very unique type of business because almost every single business on earth doesn't work like that. It's like I build a car, right? Building the second car might be a little cheaper because now I have, you know, maybe a factory already or whatever. I have some fixed costs that are going to amortize, whatever. But fundamentally, building the other car is still going to cost me roughly as much. Um, and my margins are not going to be as high. So when you think about like tech businesses, most tech businesses have like 80, 90% gross margins um it's it's it, there are businesses that are fundamentally very very profitable so venture capitalists and angel investors love to invest in those businesses uh, because they know that like hey these can be like potentially massive but you know the, the mindset that i have when i'm running my fund and a lot of most VC investors think the same is i expect 90 percent of my startups to die you know like you know i i, I hope 100 percent of them are successful but just statistically 80 90 percent of them are going to die right so the 10 percent that do well they need to be like really really big they need to be like a 10x return on on the money that i make um on the money that i that i that i invested and so that just completely fucks up your judgment in terms of like the type of business that you look for the type of business that you invest in and so it, it's just like that's why that's such a different business from like a brick and mortar like or, or you know e-commerce business where there's a reality of like you're not going to raise money from investors and like you have to be profitable from from day one or at least think about being profitable in the near future so for me there's like those two different types of businesses and fundamentally like you cannot lie to yourself you have to ask yourself honestly like what am i trying to build because depending on what you're trying to build it's two very very different strategies that that you have to adopt and, and at yob is like we're we're the former where we're like that venture back business where short-term profitability would actually hurt our long-term prospects and and, and 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 sort of like our ability to grab market share and and really win in the marketplace um and then to your second question, what's worked the best for us? So, you know, we, we've tried a lot of different things. We've tried outbound sales. We've tried paid media. We've tried some PR. Uh, we have some amazing people like Adam Grant that we brought on board, you know, who's like one of our scientific advisors. Um, and, uh, and, and it's sort of like, you know, helping us also like, you know, sort of, you know, spread the word. I think all of that can work. It really depends on your business. I think fundamentally the work that we had to do first that we didn't want to do at the beginning or maybe we were too lazy or too busy it doesn't matter is you really really need to like nail product market fit and that, that's true for really any business and for startups especially because like you you know you can invest like fifty thousand a month on like you know sales people paid marketing etc but until we really really refined what's called our ideal customer profile so you know head of talent at like a company that's hiring remotely or has a distributed workforce of you know a certain size in specific countries like until we really really refine this and then we also like really refine how they think like what do they care about do they care about bias do they care about efficiency do they care about like the emotional appeal of the product and then everything else all of the voice all of the messaging all of the copy that you're going to write on your website the, the content that you put out the the partners that you bring in the celebrities that you're going to pay endorsements for all of that needs to fit around that ideal customer profile and that ideal message so i call it like our marketing bible right. but it's like and until we had built that bible like the, the exact same channels would perform at like a third of the performance as they do now so so i think like you have to do that hard annoying work first of like what is my story and like what does it resonate and like you clearly for example like have that story that resonates like you have that product market fit right like with your with your story with your narrative yeah and and like you just have to find that to to otherwise you can use the same channels as, as you or me and it's just it will work like at 10 percent of the performance yep i love it man so if people want to learn more about you or if they want to reach out or they want to learn about jobs what's the best way to to reach out yeah um so i'm uh, i'm on twitter uh at raf danilo r-a-p-h uh i'm on linkedin as well so feel free to hit me up there although i'm more likely to like jam with you on, on twitter um and then if you're interested in learning more about yobs uh our website is uh, yobstech.com so feel free to check it out book a demo maybe you're interested in that or if you're interested in working with us we're hiring like fucking crazy marketing sales engineering you name it so uh would love to would love to hear from you guys Awesome. Well, hit me up when you get to Miami, brother. 
Sounds good, my man. All right, talk to you soon. All right, Bye. Take care.